Uh, thank you all so very much for uh, coming to this talk. I really appreciate the opportunity to share my research. I uh, thank you in advance for questions or comments during the course of the talk or afterwards. I'm more than happy to uh, try to respond or think about those at any point in time. Thank you again. Um, so my name is Nick Wilson, uh, and this is joint work with Willa Friedman, who's in the Department of Economics at the University of Houston. Uh, and I want to give special thanks to our funding uh, agency, 3IE, and to our implementing partners, CHAPS. Okay. Uh, and although this is a group project, uh, any errors are my own. Okay. So today I want to talk to you about money, masculinity, and men's health, experimental evidence on demand for preventive health input. So as many of you may know, that HIV AIDS is the leading cause of adult mortality in the poorest region of the world. So recent evidence for randomized controlled trials conducted in Kenya, Uganda, and South Africa indicate that voluntary medical male circumcision, or VMMC, can reduce female to male HIV transmission by something like 50 to 75%. Okay, so this is seemingly a game changer in uh, HIV prevention. And based upon this evidence, the World Health Organization has been sca scaling up mass adult male circumcision campaigns in priority countries, primarily in Eastern and uh, Southern Africa. So despite this really large supply side expansion, access to the service, which is usually fully subsidized, um, we have not, we've kind of fell far uh, short of uh, circumcising the target number of men. Okay. So recent evidence kind of indicates that we've only circumcised about half of these men. So why, why has there not been a rapid take up of this inexpensive life-saving technology well, one reason is that advertising may be poor. <laughs> so when I first saw this, I thought these were two different companies that had the signs on the same tree, but the phone number is the same. <laughs> okay, that was not a randomly selected image. You go on Google Images, there's gonna be lots of good VMMC advertisements. In fact, some advertisements that are even better than one I'm gonna show you today but we haven't really evaluated the causal effects of those advertisements. Let me just say one other caveat here. Um, many of you in this room probably don't care quite as much about circumcision as Willa and I do. And that's fine, I'm gonna abstract up to a, a something that I think we all care about in this room. So this fundamental puzzle about human behavior, namely the low level of household investment in preventive health inputs. I'm not trying to indict any of you all, but probably many of you in this room did not do enough preventive health today or in your life. I'm one of those people. Okay. Worldwide, we spend less than one-third of 1% 1 of GDP on these inputs, and in poor countries, this number is very low. So I think economics offers several hypotheses about why this is the case. It could be the case there's low income, uh, the prices of these inputs are very high, people may be uninformed about the, the health production technologies, they may not know that these are actually preventive health inputs. And I think behavioral economics has helped kind of illuminate other possible behavioral biases. And in my talk, I'm going to focus on a couple of those. Okay, so just an overview of what we did and what we found. So we ran a field experiment in Soweto Township in Johannesburg, South Africa. We randomized the distribution of about six or of, of postcards advertising voluntary medical male circumcision services to 6,000 households in this township. And then we just tracked these postcards at clinics. I'll talk a little bit about that tracking procedure later. Okay. So we found that adding the statement, are you tough enough, to the control postcard doubled uptake of the surgical procedure. Just are you tough enough. Okay. We found that offering a cash transfer of approximately US $10, or about one day's wage in the study setting, offering this cash transfer disperse conditional on completing the counseling session for the service, it tripled uptake of the procedure. Okay, so we didn't condition on the procedure, we conditioned on the counseling session. And finally, we found that providing information about a possibly previously unknown benefit of this, of this service, namely that among partners of uncircumcised men, two out of three would prefer that their partner be circumcised, that information statement added to the control postcard had no effect. So kind of taken as a whole, these find findings highlight behavioral biases as a key explanation for low household investment in preventive health inputs. And I'll give you a little bit more evidence to help uh, kind of reinforce that claim as we go on. Maggie? Sorry, the question is, is uh, did this work because this advertising is novel and the status quo of public health advertising is poor? Or, or very differently framed. 
Yeah, so this, this image that I showed you about the chainsaw is totally not representative. I haven't done like a representative survey that, of the advertising uh, imagery, but um, I'm actually real jealous of these folks at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health who have a much snazzier advertisement than ours. Uh, there's some good advertising out there. Uh, I remember uh, doing dissertation field work in Zambia and seeing uh, the Marie Stopes uh, advertisements for the Kindest Cut campaign. I, th I felt these advertisements were really sophisticated. Okay, so it's not that... Um, So just an outline of the rest of the talk. I'll talk to you a little bit about the conceptual framework, our experimental design, uh, go through some basic results, and then kind of come back to this discussion about um, what we think is going on here. So standard consumer theory from economics is going to suggest these four possible reasons for low demand for preventive health inputs. So something about a combination of people's incomes being too low and or the prices of these inputs being too high. Could be that people are uninformed about health production technology. So no matter how much money you give them or no matter how low you make the price, people are not going to take it up. And I think in this context, I would argue that uh, a strong taste for non-use could be a, a, a key explanation for why people are not taking this up, taking up circumcision. So on top of standard consumer demand theory, behavioral economics is going to suggest two additional hypotheses that I think are highly relevant. So one is namely that people um, around the world, many people tend to exhibit present bias preferences. Okay, and that's gonna result in procrastination behavior. I think many of us are procrastinating on health. And sorry, when I say many of us, I really just mean me. Um, and then also I think we have some, I think we firmly believe that framing, that is to say presentation affects demand, although we don't have a ton of evidence on that, at least in my field. Okay. Let's talk about the application of this conceptual framework to circumcision. Let's talk about price first. So the sticker price in most of these study settings is already zero. Okay. However, there's important opportunity costs, uh, foregone employment during a three-day recovery period, uh, transportation costs could be important as well. So there's a variety of uh, circumcision accessibi acceptability studies that, I, that we cite here that have kind of investigated these factors. There's also a large body of literature um, that cash transfers for, for health improve health outcomes. Now, we, in our study, we tried to offer a cash transfer disperse conditional on completing the procedure, and the Medical Ethics Board uh, in South Africa found that unethical. Okay, so we cut out that study arm. Um, some other people who ran some of these experiments were able to offer a cash transfer disperse conditional on the procedure in other countries, namely in Kenya, um, but we were not able to do that in our study. But we did test whether offering a cash transfer disperse conditional on completing the counseling session affected take up at the counseling session, affected take up at the procedure. So just to be clear, these men, we offered the cash transfer, they could come to the clinic, they could go through the counseling session, they could take the money and they could leave. Okay. The basic idea of this cash transfer is it might help procrastinating men kind of overcome procrastination. We're shifting or adding a benefit to today that may tilt the decision, right? So if you think about when the benefit to circumcision comes, the flow probability of acquiring HIV is not huge per year, okay? And so this benefit of avoiding HIV is being realized you know, seemingly relatively far into the future for many of these men. And so offering a small cash for transfer today may push some of that benefit or add some benefit to doing something today. So information, so pre and out, uh, question. Uh, in our study, yeah, all the men were over 18. So you had to be over 18 to respond to the postcard. So most of the men in, the, in this area know that um, circumcision can help you uh, prevent acquiring HIV. So we didn't test that. However, there's this literature that gender, that kind of um, the gender of the decision maker and partner involvement in uh, human capital investment decisions may affect those decisions. Um, and so we decided to simultaneously kind of make the statement that was gonna tell people about a possibly previously unknown benefit of circumcision, namely their partner may prefer it um, and then also maybe the mechanism by which that may possibly affect uh, behavior is by just involving the partner in the decision. Okay. So framing, there's not a ton of evidence that we found on how framing affects demand for health inputs. Uh, this Luoto et al. study is the main one that we found. But we do know from South Africa, this kind of famous study by Bertrand et al. that they mailed people different postcards uh, who were already clients at a bank and that kind of just the identity of what the person and the gender of, of the person on that advertising statement had big effects on take up. So we tested, tested the framing statement, are you tough enough? I was a little surprised this statement worked because I just kind of made this up, it seemed to have worked. <laughs> okay. 
if I could do this again, I'd also want to test things, test things like, are you smart enough? I think that might be an interesting uh, comparison. Finally, income. We didn't just kind of think that unconditional income would affect take up because the implied income elasticity of demand would be really high. So we didn't test that. Question? So just another question about the context. So this is sort of a context where traditionally circumcision has been part of like a coming to adulthood moment for men or? Yeah, so um, in other parts of South Africa, but not so much in Soweto. Yeah, so uh, just to be clear, we're talking about voluntary medical male circumcision, not uh, traditional male circumcision. Because I was wondering if there was like a synergy between your, you know, if, you, if that was in a, in a way, it doesn't sound like it's relevant, but linking this to the sort of cultural practice of circumcision, which is about becoming a man. So that could be one of the mechanisms by which Are You Tough Enough had this effect. So we, our study was not really designed to unpack that, but I think that's a really good uh, a possible explanation about what's going on here. So just a little bit more about the experimental design. We conducted a door-to-door -door marketing campaign where we randomly distributed uh, 6,000 postcards to households in Soweto Township. So this is a, a township that has relatively high HIV prevalence, relatively low circumcision prevalence because the main ethnic groups there are not traditional circumcisers. Um, and one thing that I should say here is that most uh, individuals in this township are literate. Okay, so that this postcard probably wouldn't work in an illiterate setting. So we uh, distributed 1,000 postcards each of these six uh, postcard types. Okay, so we had a control postcard, and I'll show you what that looked like in a minute. The control postcard basically had some basic information, and then it said, hey, if you bring this postcard to a clinic when you come to a clinic, you will get light refreshments during a counseling session. And all the postcards offered this light refreshments. And the reason why we offered this was we needed these postcards to somewhat be self-tracking. We did not have a baseline survey. We ran the study for about $74,000. A third of that went to a program manager. Um, so we, we tried to have these postcards be self-tracking. If, in terms of the results, we only found effects of the conditional cash transfer arm, you might be worried that men in all these arms came in with equal probability, and it was just that men in the CCT arm had the incentive to bring in the postcard. The fact that we found a result in the are you tough enough arm suggests that's not really what was going on in a whole. So the compensation postcard and the CCT postcard offered the equivalent of roughly US uh, $10 or one day's wage plus the refreshments. The information postcard had the statement that among partners of uncircumcised males in South Africa, two out of three would prefer that the partner be circumcised. That's uh, evidence from a national household survey conducted in, I think, in 2009. The framing postcard just said, are you tough enough on top of the control postcard? And then we tested adding uh, information to the compensation postcard or adding framing to the compensation postcard to try to uncover whether there's some interactive effects. And actually we have some neat results there that were slightly surprising. So here's the control postcard. I had a front and a back. Uh, it was distributed to households in a uh, sealed envelope to help keep the outreach worker from distributing the uh, cash transfer postcards to their best friends. Um, so this is the front of the postcard. Uh, CHAPS is our implementing partner. CHAPS is pretty well known. Actually, CHAPS ran the first study that showed that circumcision was effective at reducing HIV transmission. Okay, and they have ongoing circumcisions in the, a bunch of clinics in this setting. Uh, we stated the prophylactic benefit of circumcision on the front of every postcard just to ensure that that wasn't a barrier to take up. But again, something like over 90% of men in this area kind of know that circumcision works. And this is just the back of the postcard. Um, you've got to be at least 18 years old. Uh, to participate, you must be a, a male. Uh, there's an expiration date on this postcard. Uh, not all postcards were distributed on the same day, um, but uh, the day that it was distributed is not correlated with the postcard type or uh, household characteristics uh, because of a randomization design. Uh, on average, there was something like a one and a half month or two month, maybe about a two month uh, redemption uh, period before this postcard expired. Okay, so this is the control postcard. Here's the Are You Tough Enough postcard. It's just the same as the control postcard, except for has Are You Tough Enough right here. Okay. And then the two out of three statement would appear in a similar fashion. An offer of, of RAND 100, uh, conditional on completing the counseling session, would also appear on these postcards. But I'm just, just showing you the Are You Tough Enough postcard here. Yeah, I mean, we're, you know, I think there's some potential concern about contamination bias. Maybe it's a little bit hard to think about how that would have directly, if affected or help explain our results. So one of the things we did was that men who brought the postcards to clinics, we were able to survey them, right? So there's no baseline survey in the study because we're trying to do it on inexpensively. 
Um, among men who brought the uh, postcards to clinics, the vast majority of them said that they got the postcard at their household, like over 90%, and something like about 5% said they got it through like a friend or family member. Um, so it seems like there's some fidelity of the inter intervention was preserved, but um, somewhat of a black box. Dif different blocks, so the outreach workers were, um, every day they were given a, a stack of postcards that were in sealed envelopes, and the order of the postcard was randomized, and then they were told, they, they were given, um, they were told to start in a particular location that CHAPS helped us pick, and then they had a randomization procedure that involved flipping a coin when they came to intersections and going to something like every sixth household, and then if no one was at, at home at the household, uh, they would go to the next, the household next door. Um, and we were only allowed to give these postcards to adults. We tried to give it to an adult male, but if no adult male was home, we gave it to an adult, they gave it to an adult female. So we distributed all, or, sorry, CHAPS helped distribute all these postcards and then we just kind of sat back at clinics and captured data. So we captured data on a variety of steps in what we call the VMMC cascade or the series of steps required to receive circumcision. So our study is gonna measure um, several, several of these steps or, or things related to these steps. So we're gonna measure take up at the counseling session, uh, take up at the procedure. Uh, among men who came into clinics, uh, we surveyed them on their baseline, on their characteristics, including previous uh, risky sexual behavior and other demographic characteristics. We also set up like a, a, a hotline uh, that you could call or text if you got this postcard. And each um, uh, study arm had a different number, so you're able to track uh, calls by study arm. Uh, I'm not gonna show you the results today on the hotline because we see no differences across study arm. But hindsight's 2020, I would say it's not clear to me that like the hotline you know, might be a substitute for actually coming in. So it's not clear to s whether you would, um, whether I'd expect to see large differences here. Yeah, so you're not going to get the procedure unless you complete the counseling session. Um, but you can complete the counseling session, just leave and not get the procedure. Uh, we did not like videotape every single counseling session, so we don't know exactly what people said at these clinics. But again, CHAPS was one of the, was the first uh, was the organization that first showed us that circumcision worked. They're highly respected uh, for the work that they do here. We don't think that they were forcing these men to get circumcised. They could just leave with the ten dollars. So again, we didn't have a baseline survey, but in our clinic-based survey, we see that uh, the average man who came in was 29 years old. Most of them were single. Uh, they'd been engaging in, um, you know, depending on whether you think the glass is half full or half empty, a fair amount of risky sexual behavior. So this looks like this is the target population. This is who we're trying to circumcise. And in terms of the mass circumcision scale up, uh, policy, policymakers and governments are not having problems circumcising young men. Okay, they're having problems circumcising, or boys, they're having problems circumcising men. So, so school-aged children are, are participating in some of these circumcisions in some of these countries, and their take-up is not low among them. Take-up is low among men who are already had sexual debut. So here's, uh, let's just go ahead and look at some results. I'm going to show you uh, just a column chart that shows take-up of the counseling session disaggregated by study arm. And after we do this, we'll look at some regression results, but they're not going to show us much, anything much different than this. So here's the take-up by postcard type in each of the different study arms. Okay, so several facts emerge from this figure. So first, take up in the control arm is about 1%. You may not think that's very high, but look, we just, I mean, how, how many of you respond to junk mail that comes into your mailbox? Like, I don't think that take up rate is necessarily very high either. Adding compensation to the control postcard tripled uptake of the counseling session. Information did not seem to matter. So saying that, hey, on average, partners of uncircumcised men prefer circumcised partners did not increase take up. And then the challenge statement, are you tough enough? It doubled take up of the, of the counseling session relative to the control postcard. Now something else is funny is going on here that you can see a little bit in this figure, that adding something to compensation made compensation less effective. So adding information to compensation was less effective than compensation by itself. Adding the challenge statement, are you tough enough to compensation, was less effective than compensation by itself. Now there's some overlap in those compensation intervals. These are 95% uh, confidence intervals around these take up. But when we put this in a regression framework, we can show you, especially when we pool adding any message to money, it made the money less effective. Question. It's good you ask this question, because now I'll be upfront about this. The offer of the money's on the back. And it's not large. 
It says RAND 100 and it's small on the back. Now, we went back and forth on where we should put this RAND 100 statement. And ultimately, I decided to put it on the back because I wanted all conditional offers to be in the same place. So the offer of light refreshments is also on the back. Now, if you're a big fan of cash transfers, and I know there's some people in the audience who are, and some people who show that they're very effective, we kind of tied the money, one of the money arms, one of the arms of the money arms behind its back. Okay? So it's not exactly fair to say that, hey, are you tough enough is almost as effective as money. They were placed in different points on the postcard. Um, so combining uh, money in the, in the information or money in the framing statement, it's not that the, the font got smaller, um, but the money was already kind of not in the forefront. But my, what might be going on is something about information overload we don't really know. Uh, so it's just self, the postcards, people just supposed to bring in the postcards. So all we know is that roughly 1% of the control postcards came into clinics. So we don't really know whether 1% of recipients of the control postcards came into clinics. If we found no uh, are you tough enough effect, if we only found this conditional cash transfer effect, the number one, ex I think the leading explanation for what we found is that men who got the CCT postcard had a differential incentive to bring in the postcard conditional on returning. But we found this are you tough enough effect. D does that answer your question? Yeah. Did you catch the decision matrix by itself? Yeah. Yeah, so this, this is, Postcard C is the pure information. Postcard is control plus this information. There's no offer of RAND 100 in the back, but there is that light refreshments offer because all postcards offer the light refreshments to try to get ensure self-tracking. So this is not just a framing No, this is, this is not, I would, in my like super simplified view of the world, this is not framing, this is just an informational statement. Okay, so just recall the main facts here. Uh, money worked, information didn't work. Are you tough enough worked? Adding messaging to money made it less effective. These are the, uh, uh, the counseling session take ups. Now I'm going to show you the procedure take ups, and you're going to say, Nick, the slide didn't change. It's because in almost all the study arms, we had something like a 90% conversion from counseling session to procedure. Okay. Now, if it was just me at those clinics, I'd be worried that I'd been twisting their arms, but again, this is chaps. They do, this, they do these circumcisions all the time. So here's the procedure take up. It's aggregated by postcard type. So only slightly more than half a percent of the control postcard came in and got circumcised. Uh, compensation only, at, uh, something like tripled uptake of the procedure. Information had no effect on the procedure. Are you tough enough? Doubled uptake of the procedure. Adding some sort of message to money made it less effective. Okay. So really, in every study arm except for the control arm, we had 90% or above conversion. In the control arm, we had something like a 60% conversion from counseling session to procedure. But we can't reject the hypothesis that we had equal conversion rates across all study arms because, you know, we only had like what is it, nine men in the control arm come in. Nancy. I, I know that's good. I like that. Um, so although it's statistically significant, um, correct me if I'm wrong, we're talking about 2.4, or that, let's take the challenge. Let's say it's 2. So it's still 1.6. Um, you keep to that sample size and percentage. So, so we had about a, a th there's 1,000 postcards of each type of these six different types. We distributed 6,000 postcards equal study design. Right. And we're reporting the percent of postcards that came in. And this is, that came in and got circumcised in this slide. So the, the absolute numbers are not huge, but again, like, I mean, I don't think I've ever responded to any piece of mailing that came, that came to my house that wasn't from somebody I already knew. And in fact, if you call me, I won't answer it unless I know the, who the, who's calling, like on a phone call. From a low base. That that's a really good point. I'm sorry for uh, 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 trying to deflect that. Um, so I think one kind of take on policy message is that this type of advertising is not going to solve the problem, um, but I think it's an important piece of the puzzle. And I'm not 
probably gonna have time to talk about it today, but we do a cost effectiveness analysis. We're able to prevent an, we're, so we, so there's kind of two costs to this, this type of intervention. One is the circumcision costs, okay? And the other is the demand creation costs. So in terms of demand creation, it costs about $500 per HIV infection averted in terms of demand creation. That seems fairly cost effective. So even if it's not gonna get 100% circumcision, um, we should be doing this. Okay. Um, so I don't have a ton of time left, but I thought it'd be useful to talk a little bit about the regression, regression analysis. There's kind of two ways of uh, cutting these data. So recall this table at the top kind of indicates that we had this cross-cutting study design. So in the upper left-hand corner of that cross-cutting study design, you see the no message, no compensation postcard. That's a control postcard. Then we had information and framing. And for each of those postcards, there was no money. And then we added money to each of those postcards. In terms of analyzing the data, what you saw in the figure was a pairwise comparison. So you compared each of the treatment arms to the control arm one by one. And that's our preferred method of analyzing the data in our regression framework. Method number two is a pooled comparison. We're going to compare all postcards with one feature to all postcards without that feature. For example, all the no compensation postcards to all the compensation postcards. But that method number two uh, only makes sense if you think there's no interaction effects between messaging and the money. And in fact, it looked like there already was. We already saw that there was. So in, in this presentation, we report ordinary least squares regression results or linear, pro linear probability model results. Uh, if you're big into logit, we have a paper that's uh, forthcoming in JAIDS that shows the logit results. They look very similar. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and look at the procedure results since we were running a little shorter on time here. Columns one through three are this pairwise comparison. Okay, you'll see the sample size in each of those regressions in columns one through three is 2,000. So the regression sample is um, uh, the control postcard relative to whatever postcard has that particular feature by itself. And you'll see that compensation increase take up by about 2.5 percentage points and that's a highly significant effect. The statement about partner preference had no effect on take up of the procedure and the challenge postcard uh, increased, uh, take up the procedure by about one percentage point. Okay, and you'll see uh, that when you go to the pool analysis, for example, in column six, you see no effect of the uh, challenge statement. And that's because in that regression, uh, we're comparing not only uh, uh, the challenge statement by itself to control, but also the challenge statement with the money to control. And we saw that uh, combining these things made things a little less effective. In fact, Here's a regression just to show you uh, that when we pool, um, so for example, look at column six there, the outcome is, is the procedure. This interaction term is the compensation times any message. So we pooled challenge and partner preference together, and you'll see that adding any message to compensation reduced the effectiveness of the compensation by about 50%. In the unrestricted uh, version in column three, uh, you'll see that it looked like the challenge itself was kind of bad, but we can't distinguish between this uh, minus 1.1 percentage point and minus 1.8 percentage point. So what's going on here? It's kind of two stylized facts that emerge from analysis. So first, it looks like demand for this procedure is highly responsive to factors that tend to lie outside of standard consumer theory. So you're not gonna find are you tough enough in kind of a graduate textbook in microeconomic theory. So why did that work? And then the US $10 conditional on the, conditional on the counseling session, these men could have turned and walked away and left and avoided getting the circumcision. But instead they stayed. Okay, and that leads me to uh, stylized fact number two, this very high conversion rate from counseling session to procedure across all the study arms. So take these two stylized facts together and look for what's the simplest possible explanation for what's going on here. We think that this postcard cost procrastinating men to act on latent demand. Okay. We surveyed all the men who came in to the clinics and we asked them, like, were you already thinking about circumcision? Did you talk to your partner about this? The vast majority of men had been thinking about circumcision. The vast majority of men said they wanted to get circumcised. But the, the control postcard results suggest that they weren't coming in, right? So something about the nudge of are you tough enough or this $10 caused them to come in. So we're able to rule out, we think, credit constraints and income effects as mechanisms. The implied income elasticity of demand from that $10 is huge. I think it's probably one of the largest income elasticity of demand estimates I would have met, that, I, that I would have seen. 
However, we do want to admit um, from standard consumer demand theory that we did reduce the price of a complement to the procedure. Okay, the counseling session is a necessary step to get the procedure and we reduce the price of a complement. So that could be what's going on just in that study arm, but the are you tough enough did not reduce the price of a complement to the procedure. So again, taken as a whole, um, we really kind of think that these were procrastinating men. Why does procrastination matter? Well, Donahue and Rabin show that uh, men could, or individuals could procrastinate forever, or indefinitely at least, right? I, don't, I think it's hard to show that you procrastinate forever, but indefinitely. <laughs> okay, and there's some empirical evidence consistent with that idea. Okay. And the men who responded to advertising in our, in our study were actually the target men. These are the men at the age of peak HIV uh, incidence. Okay, 29 year old men. These are the men that are getting HIV in this area. So in conclusion, the framing statement, are you tough enough, appeared to double take up of the surgical procedure relative to control postcard. A cash transfer conditional on the counseling session tripled uptake of the procedure relative to control postcard. Again, we think this likely mechanism is that these postcards cause procrastinating men to act on latent demand. I didn't show you these results today, but there's some evidence that of differential selection across postcard type, but we're not really powered to test that. As a whole, these results suggest that adjusting the presentation of information and conditional cash transfers for clinic visits may have large effects on health input take up that are, that are above and beyond just visiting the clinic. And I will just say that these conditional cash transfers for a clinic visit are actually consistent with glo U.S. global health policy right now. The U.S. government doesn't want to fund a surgical a cash transfer for a surgical procedure, but they do seem to be open to funding a cash transfer for a clinic visit that may lead to a surgical procedure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs>